all of them. He has two new books back there, so you may have already purchased the others that are there, but I encourage you to purchase the other two. He is, was born and raised in Australia. He is a legal, legal immigrant to the U.S. He, he lives in Texas, but I'm hearing he may move to the great state of Florida. Yay! <laughs> so he has, Trevor Loudon is here. His, one of his books was actually endorsed by President Trump. He is a very supportive of President Trump, and as you hear, I still call him President Trump. Yeah. Because he's our president. I always will. He has been in newspapers, radio, Fox News. Have you been on Fox lately? You have? News Oh, Newsmax. Newsmax, okay. He is also the founder of Flag Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness. If you remember, we collected a lot of money to get his children's uh, student constitution declaration of independence in the seventh grade civic classes here in Lake County. They were delivered. Hopefully they are using them in their classrooms. I have a feeling they are because I have received letters saying thank you again. So, um, I, I could go on and on about Nick. I, I really could. And he would probably get mad at me if I just kept going on and on. But we are going to show a video first before Nick comes up. Do you want to turn that video on? Okay. You're an ordinary person living in the most extraordinary country of them all. My name is Nick Adams and this is my story. I was born in Sydney, Australia in September 1984. I'm no stranger to adversity. Most people wait a long time for a life-changing moment, but I didn't have to. At the age of 16 months, I was diagnosed with almost a death sentence. Stage 4, miracle stuff. My parents received the news, the worst news any parents could receive. For three years, I locked horns with the most fierce adversary imaginable. And with the power of prayer, skilled doctors, and loving parents, I overcame it all. There is a picture that I have mounted and framed. It's very special to me. It's a photo that was taken on the afternoon of my operation. And it shows me already up and about with my mother in the background looking on. I've captioned it, a celebration of life, because that's how I approach my life. From the very start, my parents made it clear to me what exactly I had been and the magnitude of it. And they told me to take every chance and jump at every opportunity to live the spirit of freedom. My parents sent me to one of the best schools, an all boys private school. It's there where there was lots of discipline, lots of opportunities, and where I really started to form my future. At the age of 19, I ran for local council, and against all odds, was elected, becoming one of the youngest ever elected councillors. The first election I ever voted in, I voted for myself. <laughs> the next year, I was elected the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history record which I believe still stands to this day. But it's not all as rosy as it sounds. Finding success in this hyper-partisan age alienated other opportunities. Being an elected official harmed my job prospects. It meant I didn't have the same opportunities that a normal graduate would. Couldn't get internships, couldn't find work. It started to dawn on me that Australia might not be the place for me. I believe in freedom. I believe in opportunity. I believe in chasing dreams. I believe in living life to the fullest. And there's only one country where you can do that. All of my life I was drawn to and inspired by the United States of America. Amen. And it's because my personality is very American. I was bold, individualistic. I was tired of others writing the script of my life. I wanted to be the shaper of my destiny. I wanted to be in the driver's seat of my life. And that's why I came to the United States of America. It's the only country in the world where that's possible. But I had a problem. I didn't know anyone. I had no connections. So I set about trying to line up a speaking tour of the United States. My pitch was simple. I'm Nick Adams. I'm 24 years old. I love America. I've got a great life story. And I'd like to be a speaker. And in a story possible only in America, and in a testament to the openness of the American society, lots of people said, yes, we'd love to have A few speeches became lots of speeches. And soon before I knew it, I became a, well, 
very long distance commuter. Pretty quickly, I ended up getting the attention of Fox News, got a book deal, but more than that, I was fighting for the values of freedom and liberty. And that's when life started to make sense. Immigrating to the United States is a very difficult thing. In fact, it's probably the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do. And my life was turned upside down in the process. But if I had my time again and I had to do it all again, I would. Because I wake up every single day and thank God that I'm here. Finally, on the 29th of July, 2016, I immigrated to the United States of America. I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to spearhead a movement. I wanted to blaze a trail. I wanted to do something for America. The greatest threat I found facing the United States of America was our failure to pass on what it means to be an American, to teach Americanism to our kids. I found that the conservative movement was fixated on college campuses, but I felt that the damage was done far earlier. That's why I started FLAG, the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, an educational group focused on K-12 education. I wanted children to know that the day that they were born here, or the day that they moved here permanently, is the day that they won the lottery of life. That they got this incredible head start on anyone and everyone, everywhere else. FLAG is as inspirational and aspirational as it is educational. Like many great American businesses, FLAG started in a garage. Fast forward to today, and we have directly reached more than 750,000 school children in all 50 states. We're reaching over 35 million people on social media a month. We're a million dollar organization, but most importantly, we are winning back the future and transforming the generation. The American people have embraced me as though I was born here. Seven different states now have given me honorary status, the highest award possible. Some of the highlights of my time in the United States, being a special guest at the State of the Union in 2019, a three-hour documentary on my life by C-SPAN, having my book occupy the entire front window of the Barnes & Noble on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, being interviewed on television and sharing the screen with Tony Robbins, and of course, most recently, receiving a presidential appointment from the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. For the President of the United States to know who this immigrant is, it's pretty special. To be called the President's favorite author, well, I don't really know what to say. It's quite surreal. I'm deeply honored. I think we're up now to about 10 tweets, about three different books over the course of three years. But I'll always remember that first tweet the most, the 3rd of March 2017, when President Trump saw me on Fox and Friends and took to Twitter to declare my book, Green Card Warrior, a must read. In all of my interactions with the President, I found him patriotic, caring, loyal. I'm going to continue to serve America in any capacity that I can. As a presidential appointee in Washington, as the founder of FLAG, as a patriot that cares so deeply about this country. In the sweep of history, men from Payne to Schertz to Einstein have come to America to help her in her time of need. I have always tried to follow that noble tradition. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What an honour, pleasure and privilege it is to be able to be here with each and every single one of you. I want to extend my most profound gratitude to Barbara for her kind invitation for me to return to be here with you this afternoon. The moment is made all the more special because I have with me for the first time in this particular hall my beautiful mother who is up the back behind the table. And uh, the cat is already kind of out of the bag, but I am delighted to be able to announce to you that both my mother and I will be becoming residents of the greatest state, Florida. <laughs> what an honour, pleasure and privilege it is to be in the land of the free 
in the home of the brave. Yeah. In the world's exceptional nation. Mm -hmm. In civilization's indispensable country. I resolved at the beginning of this year to start every one of my presentations by saying the following. Even though this is hardly America's finest hour, and even though I have lived in the United States for most of the last 10 years, I still wake up every single day and thank God that I woke up in the United States of America. Yes. Whether we were born here or whether we moved here permanently, we won the lottery of life. The left often like to speak about privilege in fictional terms. Straight privilege, white privilege, male privilege. But the truth is, in the United States of America, there is only one type of privilege, and that's American privilege. What is it that I believe in? I believe in God, personal responsibility, the sanctity of human life, limited government, a strong national defence, the right to bear arms, the state of Israel. Up there with all of those things, ladies and gentlemen, I believe in the United States of America. And if there's one take-home message that I have for you this afternoon, if there's one thing that I want you to remember when you go home later today, it is this. Despite the undeniable, indisputable and incontrovertible problems, challenges, threats and realities currently afflicting the United States of America, this is still easily, by far and away, hands down, head and shoulders, the greatest country in the history of the world. Every single time I speak to an elementary school, middle school, public high school, or college audience, I look those students in the eyes and I tell them that the day that they were born in the United States of America is the day that they won that lottery of life. That they got the most incredible, the most amazing, the most remarkable, the most sensational head start on anyone and everyone everywhere else. This is the best country in the world to be born in, to live in, to work in, to start a business in, to grow a business in, to realise a dream. This is the only country in the world where you can blaze a trail and leave a legacy. This is the only country in the world where you can colour outside of the lines and not be punished. This is the only country in the world where success is not yet presented, but still admired and aspired to. This is the only country in the world where your first language or last name means absolutely nothing. This is the only country in the world where anybody can rise above any set of circumstances to go on and achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. And this is the only country in the world where failure is not fatal, where you can fall down 5,000 times, but if you've got grit, determination, and hustle, you can get up 5,001. Thomas Edison had a 1,000 cracks at the light bulb. Colonel Sanders, he had his recipe for fried chicken rejected 1,009 times before he got a taken. Abraham Lincoln yep. lost his first 12 elections in a row. P.T. Barnum's first two services, abject failures, yet he went on to become the greatest showman. Walt Disney went bankrupt twice, almost three times. Same story with Henry Ford. Again and again and again, the lesson throughout American history, the theme throughout American history, has been that those with passion those with perseverance, those that refuse to yield, end up leaving a legacy well beyond their time on this earth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, America is special. 
because America is the only country that's not just a country, not simply a stretch of land, not merely a geographic entity. America is an idea, it is an ideal, a notion, a value system, an improbable and daring experiment that actually remains equally as improbable and daring today. It's the hope that banishes all hopelessness. It's the shock that was heard around the world and still is. There are four ways that a nation is said to be exceptional. Culturally, militarily, economically and scientifically. And on each of those four measurements, in almost 5,000 years of recorded human history. And you want to hear the kicker? Here comes the kicker. We're less than 5% of the world's population. With less than 5% of the world's population, America has dominated those four spheres to an extent previously considered impossible. But none of that success, none of that power, none of that might, none of that wealth, none of that influence just happened. None of it was accidental. None of it was incidental. No, to the contrary. All of it was extraordinarily deliberate, extremely intentional. You see, the most brilliant men to have ever walked this earth were our founders, who understood that the way to unlocking human ingenuity, the way to unleashing human creativity, the way to driving human accomplishment, was to make sure that men and women were as unencumbered as possible by the need for government approvals and red tape. It's for precisely the same reason that the United States of America has ascended to the position of guardian of liberty as the custodian of civilization. I want you to contemplate for just a moment what the world might look like without the United States of America. North Korea would invade South Korea. Taiwan would be overrun by China. War, maybe nuclear, would break out in the Middle East. Russia would attempt to rebuild the Soviet Empire. Islamic terrorists would act with complete impunity. Tyrants in North Africa would run around even more mercilessly than what they already do. Cataclysmic natural disasters would have no concerted, coordinated response effort. Individual liberty would gradually diminish and ultimately become extinct. That's what a world without the United States of America looks like. And that's why it's in the interest of everyone, no matter who you are, where you come from, what you do, which one of the new 57 different genders you choose to identify with, what bathroom you elect to use, even if you have never so much as even set a little toe on American soil. It's in your interests that America be as robust, as self-confident, as healthy and as self-assertive as possible. Why? Because the equation is very simple. What is good for America is good for the world. When America is strong, the world is strong. Now that's not my hypothesis that I've scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin after a few too many drinks with Councilman Price. <laughs> we were living that reality in real time. More than four years ago, under the Obama administration, and now again in the last six weeks, when we have leaders in the United States of America, if you can call them that, that in deliberately make America withdraw and retreat from the world, making the entire world an infinitely more dangerous place. Ladies and gentlemen, political correctness is killing the United States of America. You see, most people think that political correctness is simply an imposition on speech. Just something that tells us what we can say and what we can't say. Well, that would be egregious enough with our proud tradition of the First Amendment. But I'm here to tell you that political correctness is way more than that, infinitely more than that. Political correctness is a mindset. It's a mentality. It's a cultural attitude that says that you should strive for mediocrity and not greatness. That you shouldn't colour outside of the lines. 
lest you be punished. That you should resent those that have differentiated themselves professionally, financially, or in some other fashion more so than you. In fact, political correctness mandates that success and achievement be a measurement of how much butt you kiss as opposed to how much butt you kick. What could be more un-American and anti-Floridian than that? Political correctness is an intellectual tyranny, a choking conformity, a totalitarian ideology that strips us of our individualism, eliminates our patriotism, removes our self-confidence. And in doing so, political correctness is transforming the American dream into the European nightmare. And why on earth would we want to follow the trajectories of the once grand nations of Europe, now with demography in decline, Islam in the ascendancy, where churches are being routinely transformed into nightclubs? Those cultures, those societies, those polities have become moribund and pedestrian, grey, vanilla and dull. There's no passion, there's no innovation, there are no inventions. That's not the future that we want for the United States of America. That's not the future that we want for our children and our grandchildren and our great, great, great grandchildren. And that's certainly not the future that our founders had envisioned for us. You see, America is complex, but American exceptionalism is really, really simple. It's individualism, not collectivism. Patriotism, not relativism. God, not government. Faith, not secularism. It's equality of opportunity, not equity. It's e pluribus unum, not radical multiculturalism. These are the virtues and values that have differentiated the United States of America from every other society on this earth in almost 5,000 years. But proponents and advocates of political correctness would seek to eliminate every single one of those points of differentiation, rendering America just another country, just another place. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very personal to me. I chose to come to the United States of America. I came to make, not take. To give, not receive. To join the place, not complain about it or change it. I came because I knew this was the greatest country. I came because I knew that this was the place that would afford me the most freedom and the most opportunity to achieve the dreams that God put in my heart. But I also came here in no small or insignificant or insubstantial way to make sure that the United States of America does not turn out like the country I felt I had to leave. Most Americans, like most people around the world, think that in Australia people box kangaroos by day and wrestle crocodiles by night. If that were the case, maybe I wouldn't have left. But the international perception is vastly different to the domestic reality. Australia is and has always been an infinitely more European place in instinct, in proclivity, in values, in culture and in setup. And anybody that has even just a cursory knowledge of important policy areas like healthcare and gun ownership will know that America truly does stand alone when it comes to culture, values and setup. And that is why I am on a mission to make sure that every single American, from north to south, east to west, and everywhere in between, knows how lucky and how fortunate and how blessed they are to call America home. But particularly our young, especially those that will be bequeathed with the most awesome responsibility conceivable, keeping the grand American experiment alive. I want them to know how lucky and how fortunate and how blessed they are to call America home. That's why I set up FLAG, the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, one of the fastest growing non-profits in America today. FLAG is about two very simple things. Number one, teaching civics 
And number two, putting patriotism back in public schools. We do it three ways. Number one, through classroom visits. Number two, through the creation and distribution of kid-friendly resources relating to the founding documents. And number three, through professional development training for teachers, where we teach teachers how to teach civics the way that it was taught to all of you. In 2017, FLAG created the world's first kid-friendly constitution in conjunction with interns from the late Justice Anthony Scalia's office. We've got the United States Constitution in plain, simple, easy to understand English that even a fifth grader could comprehend. Your club has been instrumental in helping us achieve our goal. In fact, your club created history by being the first club able to get an entire school district to get all of the books. So, oh. in the nation, quite amazing. On the heels of the stunning success of our students' constitution, we created the world's first kid-friendly declaration of independence, world's first kid-friendly selected readings of the Federalist Papers, that's our constitution, that's our declaration of independence, this is our Federalist Papers, and then our most recent resource is the Citizen's Guide to the Electoral College. I am beyond delighted to be able to tell you that as of just a couple of weeks ago, we now have more than one million public school students with at least one of those four resources. And our next resource to come out in a couple of months is going to be Freedom Versus Socialism, a high schooler's guide. We've also got our flag schools pledge, where we get schools to commit to doing three single things. Number one, display an American flag in every classroom. Number two, recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And number three, sing the national anthem before all major sporting events. And I am delighted again to be able to tell you that we now have more than 8,000 schools signed up to that commitment nationwide. <laughs> Flag has also declared war on this idea that every student has got to go to college. I went to college, I got two degrees, I had a really, really good time. <laughs> but the reality is that not everybody is made for college. And we need plumbers and electricians and machinists and carpenters and welders and entrepreneurs. And there are some really good reasons that we do not want our children going to college unless they are tailor-made for it. Number one, we want them to avoid the almost inevitable liberal indoctrination that awaits them on any college campus. Number two, we don't want them graduating up to their eyeballs saddled in debt. Number three, we want to virtually guarantee them a job. And number four, and most attractive of all, we want to give the maximum amount of young Americans the chance to one day go and do the most American thing of all. Start their own business. Create wealth. Employ people. Achieve the American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever I have had dark moments in my life, whenever I contemplate the future of Western civilization, Whenever I think about whether or not the United States of America will be able to achieve something that has never, ever been achieved before, and that is to make her third centennial celebrate her 300th birthday in 2076, I always fall back on my political heroes. Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump, Winston Churchill, and Abraham Lincoln. Particularly Lincoln, all of my life, Abraham's Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's story has propelled me forward. When I think of what it means to be an American, when I think of what embodies American exceptionalism, I always think of our 16th president. 
Lincoln was an ordinary man with extraordinary desire. He lived life full and died empty. Born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, and he grew up in Illinois. No elementary school, no middle school, no high school, no college education. Everything he learned, he taught himself. He was a physically strong man, a wrestler, who purportedly never ever backed down from a fight. The qualities that define Abraham Lincoln, perseverance, strength, character, courage, they are the values that we need everywhere around us. Lincoln lost his mother. He lost his three of his four children. He lost his siblings. He lost six elections in a row. He failed in business. He had a poor relationship with his father. But Lincoln was a titan. And titans never give up. Their hearts are too big to fail. Their spirit somehow irrepressible. And he rallied, and he persevered, and he pushed, and he scratched, and he clawed to get back up on his horse. Just one more round, time and time again, Lincoln ran toward his dreams. He was relentless, unstoppable, unwavering, unyielding, a true force of nature. And in the end, despite all of the loss, despite all of the misfortune, despite all of the tragedy, Despite all of the disappointment, he rose to become President Abraham Lincoln, a man America needed at a most critical time, a man still very much in the national psyche more than 150 years after his death. So let the great lesson for all Americans, but particularly young Americans, the aspiring <coughs> leaders, entrepreneurs and inventors, that you can begin ordinary, but become extraordinary. Amen. That you can start off normal and end up becoming something unbelievable. That you can achieve anything and overcome everything. Amen. This year, America will celebrate her 245th birthday. A time for great celebration. But as I alluded to moments ago, also a time for sober contemplation. <coughs> because if you go and ask any historian worth their salt how long great nations tend to last, they'll tell you 230 to 270 years. And that, my friends, puts America right in the kill zone. To make matters worse, the enemies of the United States are no longer only foreign. They're also domestic. There are people within America rooting for America's failure or decline. So the fight, the battle, the war, the struggle that we're going to have to embark on is going to be worse than any that we have been through before. But as a lifelong student of American history, I remain unswervingly convinced that our best days still lie ahead. From the early defeats by Britain in the War of Independence to the loss of the Philippines, to Pearl Harbor, to the days following September 11, every single time America has been under attack, every single time America and freedom have been shoved up against a corner wall in a room, America has emerged bigger and stronger and better than ever before. It was Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French nobleman, who came out here in the 18th century, who observed in his sociological masterpiece democracy in America, that the true genius of Americans lay in their ability to repair their faults. He noted the, quote, uncanny propensity of these people to re-correct a cultural trajectory, end quote. So Winston Churchill, the great wartime Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, my lifelong political hero, the greatest figure of the 20th century, once affectionately joking <coughs> that America always does the right thing after exhausting every other <laughs> option. <laughs> and here I stand before you today as a third outsider, telling you that I identify the same boomerang spirit, the same resilience in the American psyche. 
Let me tell you something you already know but you need to hear again. For the last 60 years, there has been a culture war raging in this country. But only one side has been fighting. They've done it with violence, the threat of violence, lies, and the hostile takeovers of universities. They are dedicated to nothing short of our annihilation. And in the pursuit of that singular objective, they are governed only by three things. The rules of Saul Alinsky, the morals of the Chicago mob, and the money of George Soros. While this culture war has raged, we conservatives, we hard-working, everyday, regular, ordinary American men and women have been busy paying off our mortgages and growing our businesses and saving up our money to send our children off to college. And we have consistently and constantly and continually <coughs> sought the high ground and elevated things like collegiality and dignity and propriety to the point now where we wake up in the morning, we almost choke on our bacon and eggs as we watch the television. Because we cannot believe what our eyes are seeing. The local high school is changing its name. The statue outside the courthouse that's been there for eons has been designated for removal. The elementary school two counties away has officially changed the school calendar to read from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Day in and day out, there is a relentless assault on American values. A relentless assault on all of the things that you and I know and love. And it is for two reasons. Number one, all of the cultural institutions that shape and generate our culture are in the hands of people that want to fundamentally transform, or in the most recent terminology, reset America. They don't love America the way that you and I love America. They don't love the things about America that you and I love about America. They want to transform America into something it has never been, something that it isn't, and quite frankly, something that it should never, ever become. Amen. The second reason is what I call the passion gap. Always hard to talk about publicly. But we need to be brutally candid with ourselves. So here it is. For the last 60 years, the left in this country have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. Yeah. The left in this country have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. And ultimately what this boils down to is no different to a street fight. It's going to come down to who wants it the most. And until we can match them in intensity, in passion and in strategy, we are going to continue to lose all of the things that we know and love. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a war that we did not start. But it is a war that we will finish. This is a war that we did not invite. But this is a war that we must attend. For as it turns out, this is an unavoidable and inescapable war. For where you sit and I stand is freedom's coliseum. Freedom will live or freedom will perish, right here. And the pages of the history books yet to be written will reflect the actions that we determine to take. Did we invest in the next generation of Americans? Did we insist on our citizens believing in American values? Or did we permit our children to be taught European values? Did we make every conceivable effort to secure the Republic? Did we knock on every door? Did we speak to every neighbour, every relative? Did we pull our fellow congregants out of the pews and into the voting booths? Did we continue to be bullied and silenced and harassed and intimidated by political correctness? Or did we punch the bully in the nose and relegate it right where it belongs? On the dusty bottom bookshelf of some fourth-rate library in the middle of nowhere? These are the questions whose answers will determine what happens. But I want you to have hope, because by virtue of the work that I do, I'm in a different city almost every day, all across the country. And I want you to know that there are patriots fighting gallantly for our values in the unlikeliest of places.
Let the history books record that in 2021, when faced with an unprecedented attack on American liberty, we responded with gallantry and patriotism, that we were unintimidated by the cultural bullies, undaunted by the odds, and undeterred by the magnitude of our fight. This is a fight that we can win. This is a fight that we must win. This is a fight that we will win. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. God bless Florida. And God bless the United States of America. Let's go in and kick the anti-American butt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do have all four of my New York Times best-selling books here. Uh, the two most recent books, Trump and <laughs> Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization. It's got a forward by Newt Gingrich. Uh, Trump and Reagan, Defenders of America, forward by Laura Ingram. Okay, and then also my first book, my favorite, The American Boomerang, How the World's Greatest Turnaround Nation Will Do It Again. It's got a forward by Lieutenant Colonel Alan West was endorsed by Dr. Ben Carson, Governor Mike Huckabee, but the person I'm most proud of, Chuck Norris. <laughs> and then, my, and then uh, my other book is Retaking America, Crushing Political Correctness, with a forward by Dennis Prager. We're doing a great special here today. Come and see us. You can get the whole set, signed, autographed, personalized for $100, or the books are $35 each. And we also have our resources. They are available for any donation that you set. Again, come and get a business card, come and get some information. Now that we're going to be neighbours, not quite, but I'm going to be in the neighbourhood. Please make sure you stay in touch. Thank you. I want to make sure that um, if you're on Facebook, please friend oh. Nick Adams yes. and Twitter. Because he's on there all the time. I read everything he puts on there. He's a great speaker. He's a great young man. I, I always knew that he was a little younger than my oldest, but I didn't realize I could actually be his mom. <laughs> but um, he has a great mom. So please give him another round of applause.